in the balcony. Hopefully, we're not going to have much more room, but a little bit. We're excited about it. We believe for it to be the best year ever. He's believing for the Giants to make the playoffs. Let's write down all the teams we need to curse. Well, the Cowboys are already cursed. They're going to go real well. They're going to do real well. And then they're going to get to when it matters and they're going to fail. That's what happens when you live in Texas. Listen. You're allowed to like the Cowboys. You just won't fit it around here. You been excited about tomorrow? My children are here. Romy, you look sharp. Any cool Christmas traditions that we need to talk about, we need to share? We used to have one that was pretty cool. Uh, my dad, every year, would just sit down and force us to hear the Christmas story, which is ironic that years later I'm here preaching it, you know, willfully rather than forcefully. Uh, but one year my dad made us wait to open presents. Like every child would open a present, and then my sister would go, and then my other sister would go. And then my mother said, it still has scarred me to this day. So we're going to have the tornado when Roman's freaking out. Roman, I'm not talking about it. So tomorrow you can just go to this. But I pray this is always part of your Christmas tradition where you give God the honor that he's due. And I'm going to preach. I know that typically if you are, if you came expecting like a really cool, chill, candlelight service or newer visiting, um, might be a little bit louder. I'm going to preach at you. We're going to have church tomorrow. So I'm going to fit it all in tonight. So feel free to be um, excited, be electric, be in Jersey. I can hear you. We don't have to act like we're, who we're not just because we have friends here. So first, second, or third timers, give me a wave. We love you. We're glad you're here. If you come to church twice a year only, I'm glad it's with us. It's better to see you twice a year than not see you at all. So let's give every single visitor a huge hand. We love you. Glad you're here. We get to this message. call this message tonight the continuation of a series called I Still Believe. Look at somebody and say, I still believe. Sometimes as a Christian, it is a really good idea to remind your own soul what it is that you believe in a culture that is always trying to dismantle what we believe. So sometimes it's just fun to go down the list of things you believe as a Bible-believing, saved by the grace of God. Christian. We believe in healing. We believe in hope. We don't believe anybody is unredeemable. We still believe that the gospel is good news to those that have not heard it. We still believe that the grace of God can cover your sin completely. And you don't have to get saved every week because once he saves you, we still believe he saves you for the long haul. We still believe that New York City is God's. We still believe that every place in New Jersey that people walk in the light of the gospel will shine. We still believe But what I love time of the year is that it forces everybody to think about what they believe. And as a Christian, it's awesome because this, this time in Easter, by the way, we talk about the two bedrock beliefs that make us distinctly Christian. Without this belief, the Christmas story we're talking about to read, we, if we don't believe that Jesus actually showed up in human flesh, and we don't believe that he died and rose again without those two absolute beliefs, we actually don't have faith. But because we believe that tonight, because we believe that the story we're going to read, it's not some cool thing, it's not some Christian idea, it's not some hope for hopeless people because we needed the crutch, so we made up a story so we can make ourselves feel better. We really believe that what I'm about to read to you is a miracle. And if your faith starts on a miracle, that means it can continue on a miracle. So may I read you this description? Around candlelight, the Christmas story. Tough crowd over here in New York and Jersey, I'm sure it's a lot more. Here's the context, by the way. The world is not going well. People are sinning and they are dying and the world is bleak and it is dark and it is literally hopeless. And we'll just pick up the story right there. God surveys the land, he's not happy with the score on the board, he says it's time to change the game. And here we pick up Matthew chapter 1. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. Somebody say, I still believe in miracles. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, 
and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Is anybody grateful that God is with us? When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him to do and Mary took Mary home as his wife. But he didn't consummate the marriage until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. You know, I can tell by your Baptist Catholic response that you might have forgotten that this whole thing is a miracle story. Either you believe it or you don't. So if you're a Christian and you're hearing this again, you should be like, what? That story is insane. My whole faith is miraculous. If God did that, that means he can do anything in my life. I still believe in miracles because of that story. Here's the problem. Miracle, that word miracle, it gets hijacked around Christmas time because every Christmas movie was a What do you mean? Every, every Christmas movie ends up with what? The same miracle story. But the version of miracle they give, it's like somebody makes a flight or some single person finds a day uh, that you're still believing for. Or like something just miraculously happens. Like, no, oh, it's a Christmas miracle. And what, what happens is we lose the value of the word miracle. A miracle is not somebody making a flight. A miracle is not that they had just enough money to pay the bills. You know, a miracle is something that could not have happened without God Almighty making it happen. That's a miracle. story is this. God sent Jesus to a place we could reach him. Miracle. Out of all the other stuff I read this, the miracle is that God put Jesus where we could reach him. Why is that a miracle? Because we should have to go find him. We should have to climb. We should have to do all this stuff. But God loves people so much that in the Christmas story, we see the nature of God. We see the passion of God. We see how much he loves people. He could have put Jesus in a palace. He could have put Jesus on a mountaintop. He could have made people buy their way to go see him. But our God loves people so much, he put them in a barn. So the common people would always know that your God is with them in arms distance no matter who you are, no matter where you're from. So when I read that, I go, wow, God loves people so much, he put Jesus within reach. You need to hear this tonight on Christmas Eve. Healing is within your reach. Hope is within your reach. You might feel like you are so far away. We don't serve that kind of God. He's not some angry, weird, cosmic Santa who's playing hard to get. He put his son in a manger, in a book. So people in New York would not get it twisted. Years later, thinking that it's hard to find truth. Who still believes in miracles? True question, Jersey. Because if you do, it should embolden your entire life. So if you just shout me down and clean and, 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 and clap this year, if you believe in miracles, if you believe that this is not a story, it means your whole life is based on a miracle. Every single thing in your life should trace back to the fact that you believe in the miracle working God. You should be believing for miracles in your marriage. You should be believing for miracles in your life. I wonder, what are you believing for now? If we said we believe this, if I saw your dreams, would they make me laugh? If you went public with how you really feel about the future, would people go, you're crazy? That's how you know that you actually still believe that our God does miraculous things. Are you believing for the reason of our Are you believing for the you know what happens? The older we get, sometimes the more familiar we get with things that should remain fantastic. And my prayer is that I'm never going to be like one of those old, grumpy, mean people. You know how we get with Christmas as you get older? Christmas used to be the greatest time of the year. Why? Because you were getting. But when you become adult, if you become adult, how good is that? When you become adult, I'm sleeping. When you become an adult, Christmas come, becomes about the stuff that you're giving. So the older you get, it's less about missing school. It's more about how am I going to afford gifts? How am I going to buy things I don't need to impress people? I don't like to give them stuff they don't really need anyway. And Christmas, which used to be fantastic, is now quite irritating. You know what happens with being a Christian? 
we used to read that story and we like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that God loved me so much and sent Jesus. We used to read about people getting healed the Bible and we used to go, wow. We used to read about being dead in our trespasses and weep over the passage, but over the years, like, oh yeah, grace. Oh yeah, healing. I want, the longer I walk with Jesus, the more insane I want my beliefs to be. I want people to go, wow, God, do you believe that I can say the one that can point at a dead person and tell them to walk again? I serve the God that looks at those who cannot have hope any other way, and he gives them hope. What are you believing for? You know, my children who are all here by force. I said on Sunday that, you know, my son, he's getting to know me better and better. Think about the circumstances that surrounded the birth 
of the king of heaven and earth. Mary had no support system. She had no money. She had no friends. She had no route to the hospital planned out. She had no after delivery outfit for the selfie. She had no crib. She had nobody helping her. She had nobody lined up to give her a break. She had nothing. You know what she did have? She had a promise from heaven that raged against every circumstance. So I'm sure there would have been moments that Mary would have looked around at the circumstance and said, Me? Every circumstance said no, but the promise of God said yes. You walk in here tonight with some circumstances that don't make sense. Welcome to being a Christian. Do you still believe? Can I read you why I have so much faith in this? Go with me to Luke real quick and I'll show you what an angel said to Mary. And you might be like, well, if God showed up and spoke to me, I believe it too. Here's God. He's in his word. He's speaking to you. He says this. This is like Luke chapter 1, roughly verse 26-ish. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and you will give birth to a son. And you are to call him Jesus. I read all that because there's no, this might happen. If the boss gives you the job, if people like you and says he will, this will be his name, this is what he will do. I wonder if we can leave here today really believing, still believing, that even if everything around us is raging against the promise of God, do we still believe that our God can overcome any circumstance at any time for anybody? Can you do say amen, amen, say amen? Because if it's going to happen, you're going to believe this. And then you're going to leave here and go, you know, about March, say, I've been believing. God, you know, open up heaven and earth, but circumstances don't match up. And I'm going to say, can we look, can we look over that? Because God loves us. Look at the odds. And look at the eyes of faith and good. good. Stack the odds even higher. So I can show you who's God in it. A couple years ago, I really invited in, like, I tried to invite people to church. Good idea, by the way. But I invited maybe 10 friends. And rarely do all 10 come by by 10 people in life. Alone, alone. But this happened to be a moment where uh, roughly 10 out of 10 decided to come with me to church. Then I went to a different church at the time. It was a good church, a little bit of a weird church, or things I've known that I didn't want to go on. And I remember thinking, Lord, the circumstances are about to line up. There's about to be a harvest. It's all going to work out as I want. I started praying. I pray that the weird stuff doesn't happen. I pray that that weird lady isn't there. I pray that the sound doesn't explode. So like exactly what some of y'all are doing right now sitting next to your friends. Please don't let them say anything offensive. It's probably going to happen. No, no. And that Sunday, every circumstance that could go opposite of what I was believing happened. So I got all 10 of my friends, our seats were taken by ladies who obviously had been sitting there for centuries and they weren't moving. I had to like, you know, threaten people to get out. We finally did sit in the seats. We were under a speaker, so all my friends were losing their hearing. On top of that, we were behind Hallelujah Joe. There was a man who would just yell Hallelujah at all times. I mean, it is a good thing to say, but you can't say Hallelujah at all times. It loses his power during the message, during the offering, during the greeting. And there was a weird lady who has bad social skills in church. We all know who she is. If she's in your area, look forward. Where she hugs for that extra four seconds. It's just kind of weird. Like you're in New York, you haven't touched anybody in decades. Then you come to church and people are touch you. It's just like, ah, this is happening. And then we had the worst songs chosen ever. Song I don't even understand. Then we had someone get up and speak in tongues on the microphone. Lord, help me. I was just explaining how weird we worked. And then this. End of the service. Preacher gives people an opportunity to get saved one by one. To my shock and awe, I saw every friend I brought go give their lives to Jesus. I got an email from one of my friends two weeks ago that said, Remember that weird service you took me to? Man, that's what I needed to wake me up. Twelve years later, he remembers the service that I thought, the circumstance I thought was going to keep him out was the very thing that brought him in. What are you believing for? Don't look at the circumstance. Keep your eyes on the center. Y'all don't hear me tonight. You're preaching somebody. was given by the circumstance in the first place. Jesus gave you to it, and he hadn't changed one bit. Remember this year, pain is often the pathway to the promise. Don't give up on the closest to your breakthrough. 
Hey, if you think about this logically with Mary and Bud Boy on this Christmas Eve, can you imagine what it would have been like for her to carry the cause, literally? You know how close, you know, when uh, someone's carrying a baby, when it gets close to the end of the term, um, you don't want to be around a woman like that. You've been married to somebody who knows exactly what I'm talking about. You love your wife, and she's amazing, but when it's time to give birth, and the closer she gets to delivery, you just want to stay away. You can't do anything right, they get real antsy, they get mad at stuff they never gotten mad at before. You just walk around on eggshells your whole life. I remember Lawrence is a pretty classic, cool Aussie, but even Laura, towards the end of her, ends of her little uh, moments of delivering our children, I didn't want to be anywhere near her because that is like the worst part to ever get in the way of. Do you think that Mary would have had a couple moments as she was carrying the promise of God? that the pain would have been so much you wanted to let it go. What if I told you today, some of you are so close, you're in the middle of a very painful pathway, but at the end of that is a promise, and you can't just let it go. You cannot abort the cause. You can't leave it by the wayside. You've got to keep on pushing and keep on fighting. We have to be a church that's willing to carry the painful part of the process because the pathway to the promise is filled with it. I don't know about you, but I still believe God can give us the faith to move through things that used to stop us. Anybody believe me way up there in the good seats? Come on, come on. Number one, I still believe that God can do great things even if the circumstances are at odds. And number two is we close, but I mean it. God can still do great things even when the system is designed to stop me. I still believe that God can do great things even when the system is designed to stop me. So you might get through some tough circumstances and then be like, what's next? And then you look out at our life, our New York City culture, even the way our country is wired, we're like one of those people who says, I can't get through the system. I came to preach to somebody who might be thinking that tonight because I still believe God can do great things even when the system itself is designed to shut you down. You might be thinking, how can you say that? Here's how. Last time, go to the Bible. You ready? You still with me? Can I preach home? By the way, I've got glasses so I can see your face right now. Yeah. I used to just assume everybody was liking what I was saying, but now I can see it for about 50 50. <laughs> Verse 32. Here's what the angel says. Keep in mind, I don't care what system is oppressing people. I don't care what system is put in power for people on this earth. Here's what the Bible says. Here's what the angel said. He will be great and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever and ever, and his kingdom will never end. Do y'all see anything about the election? Do you guys see anywhere where it says, if people like him, this angel came to Mary and said, oh, by the way, God's going to give him the throne. God's going to wreck the system. Think about how many systems fell the moment that little baby showed up in a manger. Think about the moment that Jesus born until the moment that he died. Every system tried to hold him down and God overseed, like literally superseded every single one. The political system hated Jesus, so they tried to kill him. The societal system hated Jesus because he didn't look right, so they tried to hide him. The religious system hated Jesus because he raged against everything they stood for. He loved the outcast and the outcast loved him, so what did they try to do? They tried to kill him and bury him he broke through that break. Even the religious system couldn't hold him down. Not even the hotel industry could hold him down. Y'all know the story. Mary and Joseph couldn't even find a place to actually give birth to this child. God made it happen anyway. I wonder if anybody in here needs to hear this tonight as we close. I'm going to pray for as many people as I can. But I think there's going to be times in life where you feel that pressure. Where every system is trying to hold down your faith, who you are, who Jesus is to you. And now you're overthinking it. Like, should I even bring up that I'm a Christian on this day? You shouldn't. Should I even talk about my faith publicly? Because it's politically incorrect. Everything about the systems are trying to push out who? Not everybody, just the Jesus stuff. 
You can get away with anything in an American high school, but you cannot have a meeting about Jesus. You can celebrate anything, but you cannot bring up the word Jesus. No athlete in the world has ever gotten in trouble for thanking God, because God could be a lot of things, but the moment he says the name Jesus, now we've got problems. Why is that? Because the very system that is designed to stop the purposes of God has already been defeated. And if we believe that, we actually can know that no matter what the world does, we're not going to stop being who we are. We sat to, at uh, my children's awesome little Christmas recital, and it was awesome. Charlie's part was great. Romans part was great. The three hours of watching kids I don't care about, not great. But do you know that this seven-hour marathon, we celebrated every single culture and every single tradition, except for anything to do with Jesus, we celebrated Kwanzaa. I was Googling what we were singing about, trying to figure out, when, when is the cheat I'm looking for? The, like the, the little, uh, what's that called? The list? The program? And I'm like, where's the thing about Jesus? Can we get a line? Can we get a chorus? Nobody wants to talk about Jesus. We can celebrate every culture in the world. It's very indicative of a system trying to hold down the only thing that can overcome the system. So I got in my car after I left the nine hour recital.